Talking Landscape Photography with Christian Fletcher and Carwin. It is episode two of uh, Light Minded with uh, myself, Carwin, Christian Fletcher, and we're joined by Nick Rains from the uh, Leica Academy. How you going, fellas? Hey, morning. Carwin. Hey, Nick. Good to talk Hi. to you, mate. Yeah, yeah, you too. Long time no chat. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Nick and I go a long. We go back a long way. Actually, we've we've done uh, workshops together for for years and um, all over the place, all over the world, including Cambodia and Namibia. Well, I think the last time I saw you, actually, it was in Cuba. Oh it? yeah, of course. Yeah, Cuba. Yeah, yeah. Cuba. So, wow. Name dropping there. No, shamelessly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when were you guys in Cuba? Uh, it was oct- It was a year ago, last October, I think. So it's uh, yeah, because yeah, I went back again last October, and mm. then you were with me the previous year. Yeah, so That's two right, years ago. Yeah. Two. Uh, well, a year and a half. Yeah. Year yeah. and a half. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Um, amazing place. We had a had a great mm. tour good group and yeah it was one of those places that i think everyone has to go to at some stage if you're a photographer yeah. grunge. it's an easy place to photograph in some respects well isn't it because yeah. everyone's pretty friendly they're pretty cool with cameras you know there's some countries just aren't they're just not that interested or a bit hostile to, to not to, to individually but to to cameras but mm. in cuba it was it was great you know really yeah. really very flexible so, place very friendly so, so nick how did you uh <laughs> tell us your, your your backstory your history where how did you get into photography and uh, how long is this podcast like 14 hours or something <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah just go for it mate. we'll just we'll walk away have lunch come back in and the you... beginning <laughs> yeah. uh, no, the, the potted history really is that um, i've been doing this for about 35 36 years um from i was working in the uk and sort of fell into it through various sort of bits of luck when i ended up in australia in the in the mid 80s when the america's cup was on in perth wow and i i some people and sort of blagged my way into the media center as you know oh i'm a professional photographer and blah 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 and wow. ended up getting a job for canon running their loan service and uh, picking up some good connections with uh, stock libraries and magazines and did a lot of yachting photography for a couple of years mm. um then went back to the uk and did a lot of sport uh and news work and then came back here in the 90s and uh, just sort of picked up commercial work and ended up doing a lot of books and that sort of got me into landscape photography which is what I did for many years had a gallery in Brisbane about 15 years ago for about about five years and then I moved more into documentary work um, doing you know travel and then uh, started picking up uh, sort of work doing training and then I met Fletch and we started taking groups to places and teaching them what we knew and then I got picked up by Leica as, uh, to run their, their Leica Academy in Australia based on that. So it's been a fairly um, varied and uh, in sort of somewhat all over the place career, but uh, it, it, it ended up in a reasonable place, which is where I am now. But yeah, Nick's known as one of, one of the, uh, the best educators in the country. There's, the knowledge that he has is, is second to none. And, oh, stop and- it. Yeah, was, we did our, we, when we were doing workshops together. I was I was getting as much out of it as the participants because I would sit there and listen to Nick talk about the the technicalities, the the interesting stuff like that. And uh, yeah, it um, it really helped me a lot. How do you train someone to take photos? Like, is there how do you get into that mindset of getting what's in your head into their heads? How do you do it? It's tricky. It's tricky. Um, one other thing, I remember a conversation that we had when we started was how are we going to deal with the way the the differences between people who know nothing and know a lot because i remember that very first workshop we did at bunker bay we had i think we had a guy who was a truck driver that was ricardo de cuna and who's gone on wow. to be quite a successful um and well-known photographer but he mm. came to that didn't he sleep in the car park or something in his car <laughs> he, wanted yeah. to, he couldn't you know he, he couldn't really afford the course but he was really keen wow. but he knew everything didn't he his knowledge yeah. was astonishing mm. and then yeah. we had people there who knew virtually nothing and we remember we talked about how we were going to um try and uh moderate what we said aimed at different people and then we thought we realized we couldn't, we couldn't do that so we just basically just talk at the level that we normally talk and people will take out of it what they can and people take out, out of it different things mm. um, we, we realize that people who know stuff it's, it's confirming what they already know mm. and for those who are in the middle ground they learn stuff mm. and for those who got absolutely no idea they go holy crap what happened and uh, mm. that's awesome mm. and I need to learn more mm. so everybody always enjoyed it didn't they on some level yeah I remember talking to uh, Leah Kennedy and of course mm. Leah has gone on to be a really mm. successful photographer in Perth Indeed. and she said that was a light bulb moment for the the first Bunker Bay workshop she went along to she yeah. had she just didn't realize there was so much in it and I think 
that was her inspiration to, to really move forward and learn as much as she could. And, and she had an eye. She just needed to refine her Definitely. technique. And, and we could yeah. help her with that. And, and now she's just going great guns. Do you remember that, that aerial shot that she did with the helicopter when she went and chartered her own helicopter? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. she got that, that aerial shot of all the buildings, which was astonishing. And then that won her all sorts of awards. And it was, yeah. you know, that was probably her big breakthrough, I think, in terms of the, uh, the award stuff. It was, and it's still yeah. a fabulous image. I've, well, it was only there last year. And uh, we flew right over exactly that spot. So I remember I was telling the, my other people in my group this that story. Do you sometimes see people that you think, oh, that's you know, that's potentially a superstar there if they just clean up their compositions a bit? Like, do you recognise talent? Uh, yeah, definitely. I, 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 I look, so. I, I, yeah, yeah. I, I look, I've seen people come along and, and they just have a, an eye. There's a some they have this creativity in them. So yeah, I, I've definitely seen people that I think really work well, and there's others that. Yeah. Struggle with, and it comes down to composition for me. I think knowing where to point the camera, because we yeah. can teach them how to how to edit their photos better. We can teach them other things uh, in regard to printing and color management. Uh, but composition is always the hardest one to teach, and I think we mm. touched this on the last podcast. So, but yeah, some people just have it. I yeah, think. I agree completely. We've got a, a gentleman who came to Cuba with me last year, who's in Sydney, and he's. Um, He's a, I'd call him a relatively shy guy, but he, he just could not photograph people. He just, he'd mm. always be standing at the back when we found somebody in the streets. Mm. And then, so we, we spoke about it and, um, he, he suddenly was doing it. And now he's, that's all he does. He's wandering around Sydney. He just, he just wades into places and photographs them, but he's got a good eye. And I think that's the key. And I'm not sure how you teach that. I think it comes with practice and experience. It's interesting you touched on that, but how do you do that? How do you actually get the confidence to, to walk up to somebody in the street and just, you know, just, just grab an emotive shot? Mm, it's tricky. There's two sorts of street photography. There's ones where the person is clearly aware that you're taking their picture. That's usually the one with, di with direct eye contact. Um, but then there's also the ones which are just sort of interesting juxtapositions of shapes and figures and you've got like somebody in a red coat walking past a poster which is exactly mm. the same colour red and, mm. or a reflection of two things which makes you look twice. Mm. So um, the, the, the approaching people one is, is quite challenging because most people are not comfortable approaching a complete stranger mm. and sticking a camera in their face. Mm -hmm. um, other people are very comfortable with it. I mean, I think Steve McCurry was always notorious or well-known for being completely, f not fearless, but basically didn't care. He'd just walk up to people and shoot them anyway. Yeah. Um, that's one end of the extreme. And then you've got other people who just simply can't do it. Mm. Um, and um, the rest of us are somewhere in the middle. I mean, I've been doing it a long time, but I still... I'm not 100% com comfortable with that. And I have days where I just, I'm feeling a little bit shy or whatever. And then other days where I'm quite comfortable with it. So it's a, it's a tricky one. Nick, can you tell us about the Leica Academy? The Leica Academy is really an extension of what Christian and I used to do. Uh, it's it's uh, Leica has a, 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 what would you call it? A, a subdivision, if you like, um, in Germany and in various other countries where we offer training uh, for customers and anybody else who wants to come along. Uh, the idea is it's um, the same sorts of things that you might, we used to do basically like, you know, teaching Lightroom and teaching printing. And then we also do the trips. So it scales from sort of one day workshops for, you know, 300 bucks or whatever up to, well, you know, Namibia, which is the best part of $18,000 because it's by private plane. So that's coming up later in the year. So um, we just took a group to Tasmania, which was five days. So it's 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 I would call it high quality um, photographic training for anybody who wants to improve what they're doing. And um, we have regular stuff throughout the year in mostly Sydney and Melbourne. We don't do uh, Brisbane, Perth, Adelaide anymore. The demand was not high enough to warrant it so i tend to flip between sydney and melbourne um most of the time and, and, and run these things we also have a couple of other people who we work with there's mark strawn in melbourne who does he's a portrait specialist mm. uh, jesse marlowe is our street specialist and there's another gentleman in um in sydney bill green who's a very old friend of mine who's doing more portraiture and a bit of street as well so we've got a bit of a, a stable if you like of uh, people who are helping us out what are Leica shooters like? Are they they're more evolved? I guess would that be fair to <laughs> say? <more> evolved. <laughs> they haven't got hairy knuckles. <laughs> no hairy knuckles. No, we're, no. We're, we're, uh, we're not talking about cannon shooters. Well, I think there's 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 two. There's well, there's there's actually three. Oh, okay, give me the I'll give you the official line. Or no, it's not the official. It's my official line. Is there's three sorts? There's three markets for for Leica as a brand. There's um, the collector, 
because nobody collects Nikons and Canons or Sony. It's okay. They're 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 you they're used to their function. I've got a Mark too. That's <laughs> yeah. there you go. There you go. But they're not collectibles. Okay, maybe, maybe a really really old stuff is. But people will buy the Lakers Leica and stick it in a cabinet and wrap it up in shrink wrap and, and never actually use the damn thing. Mm, because mm. just you know, in 50 years time, it'll be worth money. Mm. So there's the collectors, and of course there's a huge collectible range going right the way back to 1914 when they first started. Um, then you've got the the fashion market. Now nobody buys a Sony as a fashion accessory, okay, or no. a Nikon. They're functional tools. Whereas you can buy a whole range of really bizarre coloured cases for various Leicas. And some of the Asian markets are really into bright colours, mm -hmm. and it becomes a fashion statement, a, a, a brand like Gucci or Cartier or anything like that. So there's that. And then there's the photographers. Um, so they're not only are they fashion items, but they're also functional tools. Um, I use them as a functional tool, of course, and I find that the uh, the SL particularly is a just a, a, a camera that gets out of the way really quickly and gets the job done, as well as being extremely high quality, which is, of course, what you're paying for in the first place. And that quality is definitely there. It's not just the the brand is over, you know, is expensive. It's also it's high price because it's high quality mm. and that's why I moved into the brand in the first place because I wanted the best camera that I could afford. Tell us about the SL. Um, the, the SL is a, is a, a mirrorless uh, full frame SLR, no not SLR, of course it's not, it's a mirrorless full frame camera built to very high standards. It's, it's fairly heavy, it's extremely robust, it's waterproof or water resistant I should say, um, very fast autofocus, uh, image stabilized in lens. So it's, it's, a, pro, it's a professional grade camera. Um, the electronic viewfinder is the key. Um, I'll, I'll never use a, a, an SLR style camera ever again because a good, and I, and, I'm, and I mean that has to be good, otherwise they're awful, uh, a good electronic viewfinder is a, is a beautiful thing. Um, you know, you've got your menus in the viewfinder, you can see the shot after you've shot it in the viewfinder, you can shoot video without having to use the screen on the back of the camera. I don't use these, I don't need to use these damn reading glasses all the time to see the pictures and so on. So they're, they're, this is fabulous. Um, and so as a functional tool, uh, it, it floats my boat because uh, it gets the job done. My hit rate's very high. Yeah, I, I have to say that I've, I've used that camera. I've borrowed yours once and had a bit of a play with it. But that, that viewfinder is the most amazing viewfinder I've ever seen on a camera. It was just so sharp and so detailed. You can zoom in and you can focus on just on the eyelashes, can't you? Mm -hmm. is, that, is that accurate? So, mm. for me, well, it's a very important point because um, that 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 camera is three years old now. So, um, you know, we may see a replacement in you know the due course for that, which would be exciting. I don't know what's coming. I, I don't get told these things, but you know, after three or four years, there's usually something. But even now, that electronic viewfinder is still considered the best one on the market. Um, and you, you're right, you can focus it without actually having to zoom in. It's it's, it's sharp enough to judge the focus so it becomes it, it i know i said it before but it's a very very functional get it done kind of camera and that's that's why i use it yeah going forward in the future nick would you be interested in coming on and, and sharing some knowledge about any new likers that might be coming up yeah well there's when there's one that's out i could well i could only share information when it's actually officially released <laughs> yeah yeah well, i do have you... some i do have some clues as to what's going on in the background but it's obviously yeah. stuff that I'm not allowed to talk about. But when I can, absolutely, I'll share it with you, no problem. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, that sounds great. Well, we'd love to hear more about that and more about what you're doing. What have you got coming up? Um, coming up, well, I'm in the middle of shooting a, a book on uh, festivals, which you know a little bit about because we're actually going up to shoot uh, one of my stories, uh, you and I, uh, in June. But um, I'm doing a thing on community festivals around Australia, community events. So it's all about people and people in the country getting together and doing something like we did the Elvis Festival at Parks, which was awesome. Uh, went Elvis to the, the Danilican Feud Buster, which was kind of feral, but that was awesome too. And Henley on Todd Regatta in Alice Springs and Gimpy Muster and rodeos and big country shows and so on. So I've been very busy doing that. So that's I'm off to Adelaide on Friday to do the Barossa Vintage Festival in um, uh, near Ypres, I suppose it'll be in around there. So that's a weekend away. Um, and then I think I'm yeah coming over to WA to do this uh, rodeo at Mulawa, and then I'm going up to Darwin to do this uh, big uh, Aboriginal festival at um, Barunga, which is near Catherine. So there'll be lots of um, traditional amazing. dance and lots of you know um, traditional outfits and so on. So that's going to be keeping quite busy for the next month. And you'll be shooting. Uh, and by the, sorry. By the way, sorry, um, Nick. It's it's Mulawa, not Mulawa. <laughs> Mulawa. 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 Hey! <laughs> Malawa. 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 
All right, okay, got it. Put him right mate. It might even be something else. I think I did speak to people, uh, a lady who lived there, grew up there, and I thought she said it, it might be pronounced a different way again. So we, we'll have to get the, the scoop. Or something. Anyway, we'll find out when we get there. Let's have a look at the photo of the week. Somebody's actually sent us an email from British Columbia in Canada. Now, I've just sent you through the uh, the picture, Christian. I've sent it to you, Nick. And, yeah, I mm-hmm. just wanted to um, have a look at it and uh, see what you think. And, of course, if you want to have a look at the, the photo of you, yourself, just get onto our Instagram, which is Lightminded Podcast. So three words, Light minded podcast and if you'd like to submit a photo yourself that we can talk about send us an email to lightminded617 at gmail.com fantastic oh you go first yeah. christian you're the rt1 oh uh, look I, I looked at this and i thought wow this is this is a beautiful photograph I've done. you know when you see those photographs that you wish you had in your collection and and this to me looks like a painting it looks like a a, a monet i guess is that uh would that be right? Would you say that looks a bit like a Monet to you, Nick? Yeah, I think that's that's a fair comment. I think I'd probably do a little bit with the cropping. What do you think? I, that yeah, the yeah. at the bottom there's some reeds sticking up, and I'd find them a little distracting. I don't know. There could be a little bit of tightening going on, but the overall mood is very painterly, and yeah. um, maybe a bit of a juge with some contrast, possibly. Yeah, I think a little bit of contrast, a little bit of colour. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a little bit bottom heavy. It'd be nice to sort of bring that up a little bit. Uh, of course, we may have not seen the whole image. It might have been mm. cropped by uh, Instagram as it does. If it's a little bit tall, it will crop the top and the bottom off a little bit. But uh, I think uh, overall, it's a really pleasing image uh, with a bit of bit of editing and just a little bit of colour, a little bit of contrast. I think it would be uh, quite a beautiful. Uh, beautiful image that would be quite quite appealing. My only criticism, if I can make that, is just that it doesn't have a particular point that your eye can start with. You know, like for instance, if one of those lilies was actually in flower, you've got that little point. But as an overall mood and as an overall texture, I think it's lovely. Yeah, yeah, I agree. It'd make a nice square, I think. I thought it was very painterly as well. Uh, Chris and I have spoken before about shooting from the soul before. The backstory on this shot is this is a, a, a non-pro um, in British Columbia in Canada who shoots on a, um, an, on a Nikon Coolpix. Um, so she was just um, you know hiking just with the Nikon Coolpix and just saw a nice scene and, and just shot it. And it hasn't, hasn't been processed at all. Like that's just that's straight from the camera. Yeah. Perfect. Fantastic. Yeah, that's good. No, it's nice to see that really when somebody's not sort of so focused on post-processing, but they just grab something that appeals to them and the camera can do a reasonable job. But I think it's always nice to give it a little bit of a, a polish later because sometimes cameras do miss some of the, uh, the, 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 the colors and some of the, the mood that was there at the time. And maybe it needs a little bit of help in that direction. But yeah, good, good job. Yeah, it's a great starting point, I think, and um, and we, we talked about emotion and, and having images that have a more of a emotional content and more of a feel, and, and this one definitely has that. It, it's 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 kind of a, yeah, it's very moody. It has a uh, a nice uh, yeah, feel about it, and I think that's important uh, as opposed to a, a tr- you know really technically perfect shot. Sometimes mm-hmm. that mood can really transform an image and. Um, I'm something that my wife talks about all the time. Then, Christian, you get that. You bought that phase one, and all you care about now is how many pebbles you can see in the foreground, and how much the grains of sand are just. You know, yeah, better. and what's your point? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I get it. I get it. So just, yeah, but it doesn't mean anything. Can you know? You've got to. You've got to add that that emotion. That's that's what people want, and that's what. All right. Make so, what life. what was Ansel Adams' um, quote then? You know. Yeah, okay. like nothing worse than a sharp photo of a fuzzy concept. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Uncle Ken always, Ken Duncan always says, um, you know, the best camera in the world is the one in your pocket. Yeah, that's true. That's okay, but you can't put a phase one in your pocket. I <laughs> uh, will. True. <laughs> you can put little, uh, S- those little Sigma cameras in your pocket, pretty much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was out with my Sigma. This- Actually, I was out this morning shooting, and I shot with the phase one first thing, and then I shot with the Sigma Quattro. Uh, just a little bit later. That's why I was late to the to the meeting, guys. Sorry about that. I was I was away with the fairies, looking too for many pixels. Too much, yeah, too much to carry. Yeah. Just, just on the phase one, because we're going to have a chat to Lau from um, uh, from phase one, who's the, who's the the R and D director, pretty shortly. But look, that is a big camera system. What are the logistics of you know going out walking the dog with your phase one? Like, how does that yeah, work? It doesn't doesn't really happen um, so much but I this morning what I'm doing now with the phase because it is it's a lot to carry around I get 
I get one the body, I get one lens, I put that on and I then have my tripod and a couple of batteries in my pocket and that's it. I don't even take a camera bag. So I just I, I go out and go, I'm only gonna use the one lens, forget I don't care if I, if there's a scene there's a I need a two forty four and I'm just gonna go with the one lens. And then it makes it enjoyable because it's a it's a big heavy thing to carry around and, and once you've got all that gear it's just you just you're not as creative, you can't move as fast, so I'm using it like I would use my Quattro actually, which is similar because it's the Quattro is so light and small, um, and that just made me enjoy using it. Oh, maybe you should rig up some panniers for Apple, and uh, you can carry the cam. She can carry the camera for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Apple's my dog, by the way. No yeah, so I should mention that. Yeah. Yeah, but she she can't come with me because most of the time I'm shooting in national parks. So uh, ah, yeah, yes, yeah. good point. She, and she would get into the shots, and she'd. And I remember when I had Fuji, the other border collie, he would he would go down to the beach, I'd take him down, and he would just run into the sand and, and just spoil my my beautiful, clean, pure sand with dog prints, you know. Just like other photographers do in groups. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, we've experienced lots of that, haven't we, Nick, in, over the years. Mm-hmm. What's the uh, what's the protocol when somebody walks into your composition? What do you say? Uh, you well, can't really say that live on air, it's a family show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, there is one lady named Barbara Brown who we know oh, really oh, well. Yes. She's a, she's, a, actually, she's a great photographer, and mm. another who, another one who's come up through the ranks, and 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 uh, Nick and I have taught her over the years, as well as other photographers, and she's really good. But she doesn't mess around. If someone gets in the way, she lets them know. And uh, we had a, a very funny moment in Cambodia when uh, a poor old man, he he was probably yes. in the 80s, um, was, he was uh, yeah he was Vince. in the, the Vince uh, Vince it was back to yeah. her shot. <laughs> and she told him no uncertain terms to, to get out of the way and it was like it was quite funny because he was because he walked so slowly or so doddery it took about 30 seconds for him to move out of her shot <laughs> it was just uh, it was cruel uh, life is cruel in, in the I photography world yeah there's no prisoners but uh, Barbara she's great she's um, she's one of our favourites and uh, great photographer we might have to talk to her one day I think she's yeah let's get her on good idea yeah mm-hmm. well, she's got a very distinctive style so it's always I always think it's interesting when people have a very clear idea of actually what they want to shoot uh, I say that in my to my groups is that you know when you've actually got a clear idea that's a really big starting point because it, it narrows your focus onto what you want rather than just shooting anything that you see so having a direction is always a good thing how long yeah, is that and take? she's the only one so I mean, she's the only one I know that's been to Chernobyl as well. And yeah, survived. true, wow. true, yeah, yeah. Oh, we've got yeah, to get wow. on. How long does it take before you, um, you know, you start, um, you know, disconnecting from the from the technical sort of composition to what's actually in your head, like building that that picture in your mind? Do some people get it straight away, or is it? Mm, I think it's something that you learn, or the, I think it's a, I think it's the threshold that you get past. Actually, the technical stuff. You know, the camera operation, all that stuff should be got out of the way, mm. and then you can actually get on with the creative stuff. It should be almost second nature. What, what do you think, Flash? Yeah, I agree totally. I think uh, you see, and it's something I noticed that when you when you see professional photographers that have been doing it for a while, and then you see the enthusiasts, the professionals can get in and get their shots and move really quick. They're always moving around. They're looking at different angles, whereas the amateurs, are, 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 are a lot a lot of time, they're thinking about how to how to use their camera. And it's not natural. Uh, it just doesn't come to them immediately. Mm. So I think that one of the great things that we talk about is is, is learning your camera and, and making sure you know exactly where the buttons are. So you don't mm. even need to look at it to change yeah, it. Yeah, I agree. It's yeah, like yeah you should, you've got to get past that. It's, I've, I said it once in a, in a lecture which somebody picked me up on and he said, uh, that thing you said was really stuck with me. I said, what did I say? And he said, camera operation is not photography. And he goes, that really, that really resonated. He said, right. I, so yeah, I, I picked sense. on that, and it's true. And mm. I say, you can learn that at home. You photograph your foot when you're sitting in the chair, or the cat, or the dog, or whatever. Don't mm. you don't have to take a good photograph. You just got to learn how to operate the camera. Then, when you're out, you're not getting distracted by um, the operation. You can get on with the creative stuff. Nick, do you want to do you want to come on the podcast again? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, any excuse to get uh, get on the air. You know, it's always yeah. good. We, look, we've got some um, some pretty uh, exciting stuff coming up. We're going to be chatting with uh, Lau from phase one also we're gonna just touch briefly on smartphones in photography as well well i just on that just on the smartphone thing i think nick had a huawei phone before i did i did i had a p20 no hang on p9 that was the one wasn't it i had one of those which i was very impressed with um but i've i've kind of gone back to the old iphone just because it's easier. <laughs> oh, shame, shame. I've got, I've got 10 now. I know. Yeah. But what, you've got a P20? 
I got the P20 Pro and the yeah, P30 yeah. Pro's out now, and yeah, I want to get yeah. more of that. I've um, heard good things. Yeah, well, I have to show you next time you're in Dunsborough, I'll have to show you the print that I made from the mm -hmm. P20 Pro, now 40 by 30, hanging in the gallery next to my Phase One shots. And um, I, look, you can tell a difference. Well, all, make, all cameras all. are capable of good results, so as long as they're working within their sort of capabilities. It's only when you start pushing the envelope that the the higher end cameras start to earn their keep. I think. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. But anyway, yeah, we're going to talk about that a little bit. And um, hey, I want to I want to get a hold of uh, quite a few other people that I've met along the way. That other photographers, a few of the UK ones, a few from America, and um, yeah, we'll just uh, get a bit of a bit of a thing going. And it'd be nice to have you back, Nick, and uh, as a uh, you know, have your Leica Academy segment. You know, we've got Nick talking Leica. Right. Uh, look, if you want us to uh, chat about one of your shots for photo of the week, just send it through to Light Minded. 617 at gmail.com and uh, make sure you check out our Instagram too which is uh, light, mi light minded three words podcast and I always say like minded what is wrong with me yeah yeah yes light yeah light minded talking landscape photography with Christian Fletcher and Carwin